Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about the likelihood function. In a previous video, we talked about statistical modeling, in particular, introduced statistical modeling in the context of a binomial and normal distribution. So if you haven't caught that video, you might want to catch it right up here. Now, the likelihood function, or more simply, the likelihood, is the joint probability mass for density function for a collection of fixed data as a function of the parameter vector theta. Generically, we're going to write this joint probability mass or density function as p y given theta. And therefore, the likelihood, if we write it as L of theta, is just equal to this p y given theta. But now the key is that the emphasis is on theta. So this likelihood is a function of theta. That is, you could try and plug in different values for theta in this likelihood function, and it would give you a value. All right, so y is your data, and theta is the unknown parameter vector. Oftentimes, we're going to end up wanting to use the log likelihood, and this is just the natural logarithm of that likelihood function. The intuition in the likelihood function, or the log likelihood for that matter, is to give you an idea of which uh, values of the parameter vector are more supported by the data. So where the likelihood is larger, then those values are more supported than values of the likelihood that are smaller. So let's get some examples. Uh, we talked last time about the binomial distribution, so let's go ahead and talk about more about the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution probability mass function is given right here. N is the number of attempts, Y is the number of successes. Theta is now unknown, but that's the probability of success. So this right here is the model for a binomial distribution, right? That probability mass function. But now if we turn it around and we think about the uh, not theta not being fixed and known, but the theta as being the value that we're going to modify and that y is fixed, we have the likelihood. So we have exactly the same thing. So if you look at these two equations, they look identical. So all we've done is change our perspective. So the first equation was thinking about y as being the, uh, the function, right? That this probably mass function was a function of y. Now we're thinking about it as being a function of theta for a fixed value of y. I want to comment briefly on the notation here. Um, you might be wondering why I don't condition on y now that y is fixed in the equation. And that's because the likelihood is not a probability mass or density function. And so I don't want to confuse you and make you think that it is one. Right? The likelihood is just a function. It doesn't integrate or sum to one or anything like that. Okay, so I'm just going to write L of theta to denote the likelihood without any conditioning on y even though implicitly y is here fixed and no. All right, so here is a visualization of two different likelihoods. So there's one in the solid red line and a different one in the dashed blue line. If we take first a look at the solid red line. Suppose we ran an experiment and we got three successes out of 10 attempts. The likelihood would then be this red line. If in contrast, we performed that same experiment but we got six successes, then the likelihood would be that blue dashed line. In the experiment where we got three successes, you can see that the values around 0.3 have a higher likelihood than values away from 0.3. Similarly, in the experiment with six successes, the peak of the likelihood is around 0.6, and it tails off to either direction of that 0.6 value. Right? So this likelihood is telling you that it seems like values around 0.3 in the first case and 0.6 in the second experiment uh, are sub more supported by the data than other values. All right, let's talk about the normal distribution. But before we get to the normal distribution, I want to talk a bit about what happens when you have independent observations. So suppose you have a collection of observations, yi, say y1 up to yn, and they are independent. And suppose that independently they have the same probability mass or density function, generically we're calling that PY given theta here. Um, good, we have a subscript I, so PYI given theta. Then it turns out that if you want to understand the joint probability mass or density function for the collection of observations Y that we're concatenating into a vector over here, that that collection of observations or the joint probability mass or density function is equal to the product of the marginal probability mass or density functions, where we evaluate that probability mass or density function for each value of the data that we have. So this product symbol here just says first plug in y1, then plug in y2, 
then plug in y3, and so forth, up to yn, and multiply those all together. So that joint probability mass or density function for the collection of all the observations is the product of the marginal probability mass or density functions. Then the likelihood is exactly that same product, but now we're just thinking about it as a function of the parameter. So we have that L of theta is just equal to PY given theta, where that's the joint probability mass or density function, and that's equal to this product that we showed above. Okay, but now again, reverse the thinking, and now you have that it's a function of theta. So let's apply this to a normal model. So suppose we have independent observations from a normal model with the same mean and same variance for all the observations. Well, we can write the individual or marginal probability mass or density function right here. So that is the probability density function for a normal model. It's that bell-shaped curve. It's centered at the mean mu, and that sigma squared determines the spread, right? Small values of sigma or sigma squared mean it's very peak. Large values mean it's very spread. So that's the marginal probability density function. But now we want the joint probability density function for all of our observations. Because they are independent, we are going to get that the joint probability density function is just the product of those marginal probability density functions, where again we plug in y1, y2, through yn, and we take the product of all of those uh, evaluated right on this PDF up top. All right. So there's a little bit of math that we can do to make the uh, joint probability mass function a little bit simpler. So the first thing that we can do is we can write in what it is, but now we can use that product. And notice that we have this term 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi sigma squared. We can pull that out of the product, and when we do, we raise the whole thing to the nth power. Simultaneously, we have a product of an exponential, and that turns into the exponential of the sum. So we have the sum of those pieces that are in the exponentials, uh, and again, we have this negative 1 over 2 sigma squared we can pull out of that sum. So if we combine those two steps, we find that we have this perhaps a bit of a simplification of that joint probability density function. All right, so now, uh, right now, this is the probability model. So we're thinking about mu and sigma squared as being fixed, and we're thinking about it defining the probability density function or the probability distribution for our observations y1 up to yn. But if we take exactly that same equation and we turn around our perspective, and instead of thinking about it as a function of the data y, we think about it as a function of the parameters mu and sigma squared. Right now we have this likelihood where we can write it as a function of both mu and sigma squared, or we could have combined them into a vector theta and thought about it as a function of that vector theta. And it's exactly the same as the joint probability density function. So all that's happened is we've changed our perspective. Right, and so now what we're thinking about is we're thinking of our data as being fixed, and this as being a function of mu and sigma squared. We can take a look at an example normal likelihood. This happens to be for three random observations that I have. And what we're seeing in this likelihood is we have mu on the x-axis and sigma squared on the y-axis, right? So we have a surface, and that surface is represented by the colors. So the darker the color, the lower this likelihood is. The brighter the color, the more yellowish the color is, uh, which is sort of centered right around mu is 0.3 and sigma is 1. Uh, that's where that likelihood is the most peaked. And now we can think about which values combined of mu and sigma squared are the data supporting. Well, number one, they're supporting values mostly that are around mu is 0.3 and sigma is 1. But if we go away from that peak in any direction, it goes downhill. But we can see it goes downhill a lot faster if we go lower on sigma, right? So as sigma gets to about 0.5, it seems like there's very little support in the data for a value of sigma at 0.5, as opposed to a sigma of 1.5, where there's still reasonably good support for that value for sigma, right? And similarly, we can take mu off to the sides and see how quickly it drops off. All right, the next video, we're going to talk about the maximum likelihood estimator. Hope to catch you there.